Hello there, and welcome to another video. Today's a very special day because, at least the day of this recording, this iMac is 20 years old. That's right, this is the original 233 MHz Bondi Blue iMac that's partially responsible for reviving Apple and making Macs cool again. I can hardly believe it's been 20 years since this iMac was released. So in this little birthday video, we're going to take a look back to see what made the iMac so different from computers and Macintoshes of the time. We're going to look at this beauty and try and restore it back to its original glory. So here's my original iMac. Before the five colors to choose from, there was only Bondi Blue, which is a little less brighter than the blueberry color that would replace it. The iMac was announced in May of 1998 and started shipping in August of 1998 for a price of 1299 US dollars. This wasn't a bad price at all, especially considering that a G3 233 MHz desktop computer cost 1699 US dollars. And you still had to buy your own monitor on top of that. So what did you get for that price? Well, you got a super fast 233 MHz PowerPC G3 processor with 32 MB of PC100 SD RAM, a 4 GB ATA hard drive, a 24X CD-ROM drive, and an ATI RAGE graphics card with 2 MB of SG RAM expandable up to 6 MB which powered the built-in 15-inch CRT monitor capable of a resolution of 1024 by 768 pixels. Not to mention the awesome stereo speakers, a built-in microphone, and a USB keyboard and mouse. And I guess it's fair to say what you didn't get. A whole lot of legacy I.O., that's what. No SCSI, no ADB, no serial ports, and worst of all, no floppy drive. Well, it's USB all the way, baby. iMac featured two brand new USB 1.1 ports, a built-in 56K dial-up modem, a 10100 base Ethernet port, an IRDA infrared port, and a slew of headphone and microphone connectivity. But that was it. Cutting ties from the past did not stop the iMac from becoming a huge success. Plus, USB was actually a godsend to Mac users. No more incompatible cables and required adapters. USB was a standard, so PC peripherals and accessories like scanners and printers only needed software to work with your Mac, as the hardware support, thanks to USB, was already there. You could even buy a USB floppy drive, a super disk drive, or an iOmega zip drive. I bet these were some of the most popular accessories for the iMac. Although USB was still fairly new, tons of accessories flooded the market, most designed to match the style of your brand new iMac. Sure, some Apple users wish the iMac had a PCI card slot or some scuzzy connectivity, but the general audience didn't care. The iMac was targeted to people who wanted an easy to use, yet powerful computer that let them get on the internet. It was a simple to use, compact, all-in-one computer, a callback to the original Macintosh. It was designed to be your first computer, so setting it up was a breeze, even if you never touched a computer before in your life. Apple's commercials showed off how easy it was. Just take the iMac out of the box, and you could be on the internet in less than 10 minutes. Because of this, the iMac was a smashing success at home, in the office, and in school. Look at that futuristic style design of the computer. The whole shape of it. The keyboard. The mouse. Uh, well, maybe the mouse. Maybe we'll just replace that for now. The iMac here is actually a Revision B model. See, the first iMacs, Revision A models, started shipping in August of 1998. But just two months later, the iMac would receive a minor but appreciated update. This Revision B update included an upgraded ATI RAGE Pro graphics card featuring 6 megabytes of SG RAM. This replaced the ATI RAGE 2C, which only had 2 megabytes of SG RAM. The CPU board was also upgraded to handle more memory as well. So that's the model I have here, a Revision B model, and it was built on November 6th in 1998. But enough of introductions, let's boot this thing up and see what it could do. Mac OS 10? Oh boy, this is gonna be a bit slow. Wow, I can't believe how little RAM this thing has. Only 96 megabytes. Well, technically that's the absolute minimum to run Mac OS 10, 10.3, Panther, but it leaves very little memory over for applications. Okay, Mac OS 9 is on here, so let's reboot this thing to Mac OS 9. Okay, there we go. That looks much better. 
What? Soft Windows? MS-DOS? Windows 3.1? Alright, this is getting very strange. But as my birthday gift to this little iMac, I say it's time for an upgrade and a restoration. So let's open it up and see if we can install more memory and what else we can do. Opening these iMac models really isn't too difficult. In fact, you only need to remove three screws to access the motherboard and the drives. Unfortunately, at this age, the plastic can be a little brittle, so I'm being extra careful on taking this part off. The service manual says to give it a sturdy tug by the handle, but I'm afraid I'd crack it. So I'm using this wedge that's designed for working on cars and tugging very gently, or as gently as I could. There, that did the trick. Here we'll just disconnect the cables. We have a power cable, a video cable, a serial cable, and an audio cable. We're gonna use this plastic handle on this tray and just pull this out of the iMac gently. This tray contains everything that makes the iMac an iMac. Well, here you have it, the source of the iMac's power. This relatively small tray contains the motherboard, the CD drive, the hard drive, everything. It's actually pretty compact. First, I want to take out the hard drive so I can make a backup copy of it. To do this, I'm going to have to remove the CD drive as well. One thing I noticed was that the CD drive of my iMac was pushed in a little bit. That's because the CD drive rests on a spring mechanism on top of the hard drive. If it's not set up just right, it's going to sink in a little bit. And so I'm going to take this out and try and reseat it later so it just fits better into place. The CD drive is connected via a single ATAPT cable which provides power and data, while the hard drive is connected via a standard ATA cable and a separate power cable. So you can't mix them up while reconnecting them. The hard drive has these metal holes that are sort of hooked into the back of this tray. So you just have to push the drive in gently and then pull it back out. A bit easier said than done. Okay, now that the CD drive and the hard drive are removed, let's take a look at other components of the iMac. Back here is the ATI RAGE Pro graphics card chipset and its memory slot, giving us a total of 6 megabytes of video memory. And here's the all-powerful PowerPC G3 processor and its two memory slots, one which is underneath. To take a closer look, we're going to have to remove this little metal shield. The iMac CPU, in this case a G3 processor, is located on this little board along with the two memory slots. It is removable, so that opens up the chance for upgrades and overclocking, but we won't be focusing on that today. To access both memory slots, we're going to have to remove this heatsink and remove the CPU board from the iMac motherboard. Now we just need to pry the CPU board up gently using the bracket that was holding on the heatsink. And there we have it. This is the IMAX G3 233 MHz processor. Next, we'll focus on the memory. Although I want to restore the iMac to its original running operating system, which is not Mac OS X, I do want to put in as much RAM as possible. And here is where I ran into trouble. It turns out that these iMacs can be very, very picky about the type of RAM they use, especially larger sized modules. My plan was to upgrade this iMac to its maximum amount of memory, which is 512 megabytes, using two 256 megabyte modules. However, the two 256 megabyte modules I have did not want to cooperate. First, I got a very strange open firmware message. Then, sometimes, the RAM would only show up as 128 or 64 megabytes, even though both modules were supposed to be 256 megabytes each. At this point, I crudely plugged in the iMac motherboard back into the monitor so I could play around with the RAM without having to reassemble and disassemble the computer multiple times. I tried switching the modules from one slot to the other, I tried cleaning them, I tried using them individually. Nothing I could do wanted to work. I spent hours on this, so eventually I just settled on using the two 128MB memory modules to give me a total of 256MB of memory. Still not bad considering this iMac only came with 32 megabytes of RAM and we'll be focusing on the classic Mac OS, which requires less RAM than Mac OS X. Although in the future, if I find more memory, maybe I'll give it another shot. So with that extra memory installed, let's put everything back together and do a fresh install of the Mac OS. Although it did take some effort, I was able to seat the CD-ROM drive back in correctly with it resting on the spring. 
This way it's no longer sunken into the IMAX case. Getting the tray back into the iMac was a bit difficult since everything is upside down and the cables kept getting in the way. I was also worried that the CD drive would fall out of place, but thankfully somehow I got it. Next we just need to reattach these four cables and then put in this screw. Then we have two more screws that go into the tray of the iMac to hold it in place. Now to put the plastic bottom on, again being very careful not to crack any of the plastic. Cosmetically speaking, this iMac is in pretty good condition, except for this little label here. This tape label was put on here ages ago, and it wasn't coming off easily. Even with some 91% alcohol, I had to use this plastic wedge to get some of the smaller pieces off. There, now that looks much better. It took me a while, but I found my stash of macOS install discs. It looks like I have plenty to choose from here. However, these discs here were not exactly for my model. Ah uh, yes, the orange discs. These are what I was looking for. Ideally, I wanted to install the original version of the macOS for this computer. Apparently it shipped with macOS 8.5, although its revision A sibling actually shipped with macOS 8.1. But the disc I have here has 8.6 on it. So I searched through my discs some more, and to my surprise, I found exactly the one I was looking for. Inside this folder were a few discs that, upon closer inspection, were not the same. One has 8.6 and the other has 8.5.1. So now that I have the right disc, let's boot up from the CD. Then we'll erase the hard drive since it's been all backed up. Now we'll install the Mac OS. Thankfully the time remaining here was lying to us and it actually installed much faster. Okay, now the installation is complete, so we're just going to restart our computer. Okay, well that was unexpected. I ran into a similar issue after installing macOS 8.5 on a blue and white G3 tower. In that case, a simple restart fixed the issue, so let's hope that's the case here as well. Okay, great, it looks like things are working fine now. So we'll just use this setup assistant to set up our brand new iMac. Okay, now let's set ourselves up so we could access the internet. And yep, we are online. What else can we do? Well, let's see what else is on this disk. Okay, we could install Adobe Acrobat Reader. And I guess we'll install Claris, I mean, Appleworks as well. Ah yes, Nanosaur, that's a classic. This iMac is a very capable machine, and it's very responsive running in its original macOS software. So let's crank up the heat here a bit. Hmm, how about a game of Unreal Tournament? <laughs> so on first launch, we're automatically thrown into a blown up 640 by 480 resolution. I'm actually going to change it to 800 by 600 here, just because the performance difference just really isn't too much. All right, let's just set up some controls and some other things here and start a match. Okay, so at best we're hovering around 18 to 19 frames per second, which isn't too bad, but usually at minimum, you'd want to be getting over 30 frames per second consistently. But on quick action games like this, such as a first person shooter, the more frames the better. In addition, this is a simple one-on-one -on -one match which takes place on a relatively small game map. As I progressed through the game, things got a bit slower as there were more enemies and much larger, more complex maps. It never really bordered on unplayable, but I guess I have a high tolerance for things. Plus, running the game under such conditions doesn't really do the game justice. Just for fun, I set the resolution to 1024 by 768 which is the maximum video resolution of this iMac, just to see how badly things would run. And yeah, at this resolution, I would call this unplayable. You're only getting about 6 to 8 frames per second, so if you really want to play a demanding game like this on the iMac G3, you're better off using the lower graphics settings. That isn't to say the iMac can't play any games. Actually, it does a pretty good job with most titles like Nanosaur, Bugdom, The Sims, and many others. But with only 6 megabytes of video memory, don't expect it to be a hardcore gaming machine. 
However, the iMac is still plenty fast and can handle most tasks quite easily. From surfing the web to using Photoshop or AppleWorks, this machine is more than capable and ran very, very well back in the day. And yes, although it is possible to run macOS 10 on these early iMacs, I recommend staying with macOS 8.5 through macOS 9.2. These machines are just so much more responsive and faster with these operating systems. Although if you're a brave enough individual with plenty of memory to burn, macOS 10.3 Panther is the last version officially supported by this model. But in my opinion, the classic macOS just looks perfect on this machine, and I think that's the way I'm going to keep it. Well, that's about it for this video. I appreciate you taking a trip back in time with me to celebrate this iMac's 20th birthday. If you like these types of videos, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel here. You could also support me on Patreon or follow me on Twitter and Instagram. It's a good way to keep tabs on me as I'm in between videos here and tinkering around with some old Macs. So that's about it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.